you ready for the incredible sound of classic rock? rock? No? Good, because now it's time for Visiting the Village. Welcome to Visiting the Village, I'm Paul Kilduff-Taylor and with me is the inevitable Ian Hardingham. Hello Mr Paul Kilduff-Taylor, I tried to get the Olympic Committee to recognise this podcast as a sport, but apparently I don't lose enough weight while doing it. Let's get out of this dungeon. It's the top story. Mario Maker came out recently and a recurring criticism of the game is that it's not possible to build a cohesive set of levels for people to play. Michael Thompson in the Washington Post also called it a bad comedy and an engine for circulating horrible new Mario levels. Ian Harding, what do you make of Mario Maker? Well, the thing that is most attractive to me about Mario Maker is that you can play it Uh, using the graphical set of any one of the previous Mario games. So unlike all of the new Mario games, whose graphical styles I really subjectively dislike a lot and uh, don't do it for me at all, whenever I see Mario Maker levels that are based on Super Mario World or Super Mario 3, I get really excited. So I'm quite into it. But, uh, But the thing that is really interesting here is that this is in the Washington Post, and I do not believe that Michael Thompson is a is a traditional games journalist who writes in a lot of games only portals and it's so interesting to see uh, a non games view of creativity in games so let me read a small snippet of this in quotes there is a futile egotism to super mario maker a piece of software that caters to the delusory belief that enthusiasm and creativity are interchangeable that being a fan of something can if practiced well enough create an equivalent to the work to which one's fandom is fixated so the real, just the fact that that he's trying to point that out is just so different to the kind of articles you'd see on RPS or Eurogamer. I feel like in computer games, uh, we don't really think about that. We, it's so important that people who play games can also edit those games, mod those games, make levels for those games, that it almost just feels like something that's completely natural to us basically and this very different that people from outside our industry don't feel the same way well michael thompson does generally write on games and he's written on games for quite a number of different outlets um so i think what he's trying to do here is actually just take a very specific take to a mainstream outlet rather than being somebody who is generally not versed in in games and writing about games because he is um And that, to me, is interesting as well, because I think a lot of people have responded to this piece uh, around the entirety of games because it's so aggressively specific. Um, Brendan Keogh uh, wrote about the idea of bad games being good. He said, if Mario Maker kind of encourages bad creation, then that's good because people should be encouraged to make bad games. They should be encouraged to share those bad games with other people. Making bad creations is how you mature as a creator. Um, And I kind of like that take. This is just a tool for people to do stuff. And the fact that people do a lot of bad stuff with it is just inherent to the creation of a tool, I think. Yeah, sure. Well, my apologies to uh, to the author if I've got his background wrong. Um, and absolutely what you say is, is right. I'm sure that this is a nice hook to give to a lot of people who aren't generally reading Eurogamer all of the time. Um, it just, again, if I, if I were exposed to a bunch of very, very amateur films, I might find that a bit offensive as well because uh, I'm probably the film equivalent to the people who only ever play uh, Call of Duty when they get home. Uh, and I only want to see the really well-produced, really polished stuff. So I definitely understand where this is coming from. But it's just so much part of the landscape that games come with editors mm. and that people will play around with them a lot. I mean, I have to say that playing other people's creations is really not why I would pick up Mario Maker. I, I, I like the idea of just playing with a really interesting editor, playing with a bunch of assets from games that have a lot of nostalgia for me, and then sort of poodling about and seeing, I'm getting bored probably after about an hour and a half at most, but really this is more about Mario nostalgia for me than it is about sharing my creations with others. I think that's going to vary for different people, but I really agree with you. Like the fun aspect of this and the way it's marketed is like, you can make a thing. It's not 
sort of done as like hey it's the little big planet of mario where you can uh you know you can experience all these huge variety of levels it's like oh i could do this and i could share it with my friends and i think that's fine like i think criticizing the output is also fine like people shouldn't be afraid to say that these things are bad again that's why i like brendan keogh's take because it's you know he's acknowledging that these things are bad there might be some really terrible levels the thing is though i mean i've already seen some pretty amazing mario maker levels there was a guy I, i'm really annoyed that i can't remember his name but there was a video recently this kind of sad existentialist thing about mario being confused about his life and walking around with all of these slogans written in coins ominous slogans written in coins above him and uh, all of the enemies representing different trauma that mario had kind of gone through it's absolutely brilliant really really funny um i think this issue of not being able to make sequences of levels is something that i can really easily imagine being missed out in development but actually is really fundamental i like carolyn pettit's take on this that she always like Mario as like the traveling plumber who goes on a fantastical journey and you can't make that in this game because you can only make one level I think that's a good point yeah I was going to make a a comment that's very similar to that one of the reasons that I'm not really into playing um, fan made levels of really any game I've tried a little bit with Thief and a little bit with Far Cry 1 oddly enough the thing is that I'm a person that's so affected by the context within the thing that I'm experiencing. The idea of just playing a one-off level just sort of doesn't seem very attractive to me at all. I want mm. to play through, as you say, the sequence that has been designed by by a professional and and see how they use the the extra diegetic stuff and the, and the meta stuff and the stuff around the levels to create this really interesting immersive experience. So uh, it's something that I sort of find a bit irritating about trials-based games as well, when mm. it's so much about the individual level. Uh, there's something that seems really lost to me. But you're absolutely right. That's that's a really silly thing to have left out. People are going to want to make uh, sequences of levels, and I'm, I guess they might even patch that in. I was just going to say that. N- Nintendo, Neo Nintendo, with all of its um, fan-serving, it's probably definitely the wrong term, uh, with <laughs> adherence to what the community wants, I think they could well patch it in. It's also the kind of thing, like, from a dev perspective, I can easily imagine why they didn't do this there's something about that that just seems like a sort of big feature in in quotes yeah i i agree i think it's from a programming perspective if you don't start out right from the beginning Mm. as treating a unit as a set of levels rather than a unit as a level you get you get into real trouble and it would be a massive refactor to fix it so i can see why they haven't and i'd like to see uh, if they do, I really want to pick this up. I- I've got a bit of a antagonistic relationship with the Wii U. I was really disappointed when I got one, and the first, the Mario game that I bought it, which I think was Super Mario 2D World or something, had this really atrocious thing where the the Coopers jumped in time to the music, which was oh, the yeah. most insulting thing I'd ever seen in a video game <laughs> because that just seemed to me to be. Um, uh, compromising the purity of the level design for something really stupid and aesthetic. So, uh, me being rather a silly person, I got so upset with that, and I and I find the uh, the the Wii, the whatever they call it, the tablet controller thing, a little bit plasticky. So I've always been a bit anti the Wii U, but Mario Maker is perfect for the console. I really like the idea of using that tablet controller to make these levels. It's actually made me tempted to, to pick one up. Yeah, I've definitely been tempted to pick one up. I will just say, I think the the debate around this game has been really interesting and productive. It's produced quite a lot of good writing. Uh, Critical Distance, which is a site that I'm probably going to be talking about more, collated a bunch of stuff to do with this. Um, and I recommend people go there and check it out. I think it's really cool when a game is produced that has a creator development there are a lot of um, electronic music producers who started off using playstation music games as the first place they produced music so i do really buy into the argument that someone could play this and then want to make their own game and that can be a really really meaningful thing especially for young kids yeah i could imagine this leading to even more people wanting to make (laughs) platform games uh this has actually reminded me that one of the most creative things ever done in a mario game was pretty awesome and, and maybe i can't top it by playing with this uh when I was playing Mario World with the action replay plugged in, which was, uh, for those of you people not as old as me, I may not have heard of this. It's basically this weird cheat cartridge, which you plugged into the console and then plugged the game, your selected game on top of it. And it would basically allow you to hack into the active memory for the game. And it would do a lot of very boring things like uh, give you extra lives, etc. But there was this basic this mode where you tried to train it, where you reset the game at a point where something you wanted to be true was true, like 
uh, say you were flying and then you reset the game at a time when you weren't flying and if you did this a number of times the idea was that the uh, the action replay could learn hmm. the specific value register that you were looking for and basically give you a code to have it always on anyway one of the best action replay cheats i ever made was something which produced um a mario platform underneath you whenever you jumped oh, yes. which was really really <laughs> awesome i didn't really understand why that was something that the action replay could have access to at the time but uh yeah that was that was very very cool for young ian i i, I remember that that also slightly reminded me of these incredible speed run glitches i think we covered one uh, on a previous episode where it's just kind of about setting this one flag by doing things to adjacent memory slots to it i really like the kind of very discreet way that a lot of these older games seem to have been programmed yeah, I'm, I'm actually just kind of wondering now whether we should make the indie action replay because some parts huh. of that were really fun. Wow, that would that would be amazing. That's a good idea. PC Gamer has a piece up about CSGO's most expensive skins. My favourite is the AK-47 Fire Serpent, which retails for an eye-watering $1,356. Apparently, these skins saved CSGO from being a mostly outsourced project meant to bring Valve series to PS3 and Xbox 360. They're also a factor in skin gambling, which is a lot less salacious than it sounds, uh, and it's still a controversial practice embedded within the game scene. Is aesthetic DLC like this vital for multiplayer competitive gaming now so the story that's being told um we're, we're talking about a, a range of articles here but the story that's being told by one of them which is how csgo went from being pretty unpopular to being pretty popular via the introduction of aesthetic uh, dlc basically um talks about how counter-strike had a really unique problem which is that when csgo was in development the whole scene was split between old, old, old Half-Life 1 engine Counter-Strike 1.6 and only relatively old Source engine CS Source. And basically these, these, these two groups were pretty huge and had no interest in playing the other version. And one of the desires around making CSGO was to bring these two communities together. But actually, while the game was being developed, it really was mostly meant to just be a thing to port to the PS3 and the Xbox 360. And I remember playing a pre-release version of CSGO. I was given a code for it by a Valve employee at PAX in 2011 or 12. And being really put off by it. It felt like a console port. And I'm a huge CS fan and I just never went back to it really. But what they found was that there was nothing they could do rules wise or, or game design wise to bring these two groups together. The 1.6 and the CSS guys together. And it was only when they basically put in aesthetic dlc which was for a completely different reason did they find that that was attractive enough to people to finally get them to leave their creaking old versions of cs and and come to the new version so that's a pretty interesting story i'm not sure if there's a lesson there for anything else really because i think it was quite a unique environment well you say that but then this is such a theme with valve i mean tf2 dota and this all basically rely on aesthetic dlc uh, to some extent right. and that's kind of quite astonishing because I think that people still have this doubt that it's significant or important and it just seems to be absolutely essential now Sure, um, I definitely don't doubt that it's it's massively important. I mean, when you have, and actually, I think this is a case where DLC FTP stuff actually allows for better game design. Yes. Um, because what you've got with CS, with Counter Strike in general, is you've got a very, very, very pared down game, and and luckily they haven't tried to mess with the core mechanics, which is not generally a particularly FTP friendly kind of thing. It needs to be very fair, and you've only got a small number of weapons, etc. And what's great about what Valve's approach has sort of discovered is that you can use aesthetic dlc to make these kind of games really exciting to a lot of people who wouldn't be happy playing them if they were just kind of the basic versions and it's it's one of the reasons why we wanted to try and try and do something similar with frozen synapse because there are a lot of similarities in terms of how pure and pared down a game that is yeah and how if you only stick to aesthetic dlc you that you're gonna have like a really good success with that mm. the thing that i find most romantic actually is these skins that you only get during major tournaments yeah. and the the kind of the ones that are, that have this brand of you know a pro gamer or a tournament that happened three years ago i love that kind of thing and something which blew me away 
is that Valve have been incentivizing you watching CSGO tournaments by giving spectators random skin drops. How yeah. awesome is that? Imagine yeah. if like I was watching a tennis tournament and I suddenly got mailed some decal for my <laughs> tennis racket. That is so cool. Yeah, and then again, they're learning so much about this stuff that's kind of been happening in Dota and as well, um, really trying to integrate the viewing with the game. And CSGO is, is justifiably one of the greatest esports. It doesn't get talked about that much, I think because a lot of people associate sort of FPS esports with that kind of 90s quake era, or also with the kind of terrifying shouting sweaty bro nature of some of it but actually if you sit down and watch a csgo match and you don't look at the chat <laughs> you can have quite an interesting experience um so i definitely recommend that yeah the, the romance of these rare skins also this thing of you know if you kill someone you can take their gun i think is really cool and the gun has the owner's name on it and all that kind of stuff um that seems really good and it really ties into a lot of a lot of the competitiveness of why people play multiplayer games like a lot of of playing a multiplayer game is about looking good to people within the context of that game and that doesn't have to just be about your skill although it helps if it's kind of related to it it's kind of about your whole your whole persona within the game yeah and i think we're really only discovering that element of gaming like we've been through developing of what of what competitive games need to be what's going to be popular what the right kind of scale for them is and now we're kind of moving into a, a much different area i mean basically fashion and showing off are one of the core things that we're looking into right now. And obviously that's come out because of money. Mm. But money doesn't have to be evil. Uh, it can produce really nice things yeah. that work well within in the game. And I think we're just trying to find the right area. One of the things that really surprised me from reading up about this whole subject, uh, and I wouldn't have guessed this before I read about it, is that CSGO is now much more popular than Team Fortress 2 was at its peak. Right. Um, which I'm really happy to hear uh, because I much prefer CSGO for various reasons to Team Fortress 2. And I was always really surprised by it because Team Fortress 2 at its peak was absolutely gigantic, but CSGO has surpassed it. Yeah, yeah, no, that is actually surprised to me as well, especially as CS is such a hardcore game. It's so, you know, it's so difficult to play um to play well that that is genuinely surprising and team fortress 2 always had that kind of more knockabout general quality to it that I, I would think would be more appealing but i mean it's it's always in the in the top 10 i'm sure we'll be talking about it again later on but it's uh yeah it's quite an incredible phenomenon <laughs> Touching, Touch Arcade have published a confession of sorts from an F2P game producer. In it, uh, the producer explains at some depth just how far companies will go in order to exploit your behaviour. In particular, Facebook has enabled them to build an incredibly detailed profile of your tastes, preferences of, and social circle, which they can then use to provide targeted offers and so on. Um, Ian Hoddingham, is this scale of data collection even necessary? I don't know. I mean, we touched on this on the podcast before when I made the suggestion that F2P was going to be the at the forefront of, of, of personal data collection, that they were going to be the companies that were, would go to deeper and deeper and deeper levels of trying to find what's meaningful about a person as it pertains to their habits online and their buying habits online. Um, we're talking about this story. It's always fun to talk about evil F2P people. Uh, and there's some pretty interesting stuff in here. I just want to talk about something which I think is kind of uh, really, really interesting. So this this guy who's making this confession, um, one of the kinds of data that they look for is if there's a game that you can get, uh, uh, you can you can you can get anything that has a country flag on it. So if you can get a skin or a car or your own personal decal that has country flags, they love looking at that to find out what country you're from. And if the country you're from is it originally is different from the country that you're currently living in, where they get your IP address to find out about that, then that can tell you so much, tell them so much about you as a player, mm. which is really, really terrifying. I mean, it's just something as simple as that, that they're using something as really basic as which which icons you like yeah. and using that to decide um, what what's what about you is going to make you buy stuff and also there's a story about how they found a, 
a whale, a guy who was spending an awful lot of money in the game. They found out what his favourite sports team was and started creating specific DLC for this guy in his sports team's colours mm. uh, to just try and sell him more. Now, I'm a bit surprised that that's profitable enough for them to do on such a specific level. Yeah, I mean, th- there is that thing, though, about the majority of revenue coming from this small group of extremely, you know, large whales, as it were. Um, so I guess, you know, actually targeting them on an individual basis is something that you could potentially do if you had a big enough team. I mean, I actually liked that story. That kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, that, hey, I mean, I'd, I'd love it if people started changing games to make me like them more. Uh, that would be great. I'm happy to pay money for that probably not as much money as they were charging but you know um so that's interesting one thing i find weird about this is the amazing lengths to which they go to collect data on individual players compared to the reaction of a lot of developers which is just to completely avoid any kind of analytics whatsoever i don't really understand why there's such a massive divide there well i think one of the most immediate things i think of when you say that is the relationship between creating a you know an art, artistic entertainment product based on what you think is a good thing to do next and based and creating it basing off what other people say they would like and feedback from other people because getting the balance of that is tricky and i think a lot of creators want to just believe that they're going to make something very disruptive that people don't know that they want yet and are really in that mindset. And as you imply, that's not a good mindset to be in. You you, you need to have a lot of that, I, I genuinely believe, if you're making kind of a certain kind of game, at least. But at some point, you have to switch yeah. and start just taking a huge amount of feedback. So um, your, your point is that people don't do it anywhere near enough, and maybe these FTP guys do it in a little bit too much of an odorous way, but actually we should be learning from them rather than just, just sort of criticising them. I think I still believe that because, like I say, I think there are really good things Things that you can do. A lot of it is, is about how you approach it. If you're looking to milk the maximum amount of money out of people at any cost, which a lot of these companies are, then I would suggest that's bad because businesses that do that generally are bad and bad things tend to happen. But just having the information and the ability to interpret it allows you to then do whatever creative decision you could you could possibly want. I was talking to um, F2P guru, and he'll hate me saying that, Nicholas Lovell, and he said that the best time to use analytics is when you have a question that you want to answer where there might be sort of two or three possible outcomes. And the question can come out of a creative motivation from the dev team or from a desire, but then you can say like, hey, will people prefer this? And you can answer that question. So to me i think analytics need need to be kind of rehabilitated in the more creative dev community and the more monetarily driven insane stuff like this needs to get some of the moral insight of the creative community maybe i mean i just think there's a psychological problem from players um not particularly wanting data to be collected on them yeah Uh, it for some reason it makes me think about the problem with fallout 3 and oblivion where the areas that you went to were auto-leveled based on how good your character was at the time yeah. and how massively offensive people found that. And I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I think it was a good design in a lot of ways, but it's got some really big problems. Mm. And I think people don't want the experience to be uh, changing based on their own behaviour, which is so funny because, as you said earlier, what, what would be better in life if it was constantly changing so we enjoyed it more but yet that's something that people really don't want certainly from open world games yeah and i'm intrigued i think that people don't they don't want you to suddenly make a conclusion from the fact that they stopped playing halfway through level two they, they don't want to be predicted like that they don't want to, to to be analyzed like that it's just really really upsetting to a lot of people so i think that causes a problem as well I think, though, that if your analytics were good enough, you could find out whether or not that was true. So if you have a system that adapts levels to players and players don't like it, that would become very apparent through the analytics. Sure. No, absolutely. I'm just kind of looking at the general psychology of especially open world games, but but a lot of games you want to you want to engage with it as a as a as a singular. Yeah 
concrete thing, not something which is morphing. I know that's not really what we're talking about here. You know, you could yeah. be testing a game in pre-release and using a lot of data to find out what the right thing to do is. But but even I have some weird emotional problem with the idea of dying at the end of level two and that suddenly being fed back and kind of eventually having some mild impact <laughs> on some change the developers made to level two. I think there's a really odd emotional thing going on there because obviously testing is really good, um, but you don't, you, as a human, you kind of don't want all these tiny little data points yeah. uh, to become meaningful in some way. Right. And so a lot of that, I think, is this, the sensation of, of being watched, of having your data collected. And also you want to, it breaks immersion because you want to feel like you're interacting with the world. And the world should be arbitrary sometimes and maybe should frustrate you sometimes. I think that one of the problems probably is actually the sophistication of interpreting the data is perhaps not at the level where that would ever show up. So, you know, if I rage quit a game because something went wrong, that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop playing the game forever. And it eventually, it might be a problem with my play that I'm trying to work out on my own. And there's stuff like that, which I don't think you could really measure. Maybe you can. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's all very cogent. I agree with all of that. Another games slash art thing on Gama Sutra this week. In it, Catherine Cross suggests that games uh, should pay attention to 19th century painting. And she highlights the work of Gustave Caibot, who used realistic portraiture to depict unusual subjects and was mocked at the time when a lot of formal innovation was happening. Ian Harlingham, do you think that games can learn from 19th century art? <laughs> I'm sure that they can. This specifically is about basically this this painter was disruptive he did he was painting a lot of apparently nude ugly people <laughs> and this really offended yep. all of the existing art fans and we all know what it's like to do something new in games and offend a lot of people <laughs> Uh, so I definitely think we can learn from that I mean I'm always interested when I read these these very um, art crit approaches to games because I still take such a, a mechanics and experiential approach and I find it hard to make the link between something like uh, the way in which Metal Gear Solid only saves the stuff you pick up at certain points and how that's very impactful to me as a player. I find it very hard to work out if that is at all relevant to much more artistic concerns or what it, what if there's any simile for that within the paintings world. So I'm always interested because when I, when I go into an art gallery and I look at a painting... I'm trying to work out what part of me playing a game is is, is like that, and you know, specifically, and on a much more metaphorical level, uh, is it the entire process of playing a game is like taking in this this artwork, or is it a specific level, or is it just a specific part of it, or is it really not that related in experience at all? So I think I'm just at the beginning of my own personal journey of working out what art in games means to me i think trying to understand all of these different kind of strata of how you relate to a game from mechanics to visual aesthetics i mean catherine cross here even talks about the use of a kind of triple a signifying thing like an engine to present something which is a very personal and intimate story like tale of tales sunset um, so that I think one of the issues that people tend to have with criticism of this style is that they don't know, as you say, they kind of don't know what to do with that. If they're a developer, they're not thinking about the statement that using the AAA engine makes particularly, although I think you could argue that the Chinese room do. Um, they're thinking about, hey, I need to use an engine. Here's an engine. Let's go. And critics can sometimes come in and sort of build on top of that in a way that is perhaps not particularly useful. But I think things like this piece, which is very easy to read and it's very clear, but it still has a good amount of sort of research and exposure of new details. I think this is the kind of thing that, that could be really interesting. I mean, she said some really interesting stuff um, about a topic that's extremely relevant to something that we're working on right now uh, later on. So I think that was, you know, that was a decent thing that she was able to draw out of looking at these paintings and something that I'd never considered. So I think you have to be very careful when you do this kind of uh, cross-media criticism to make sure that what you're saying is productive. And I just consider this to be a, a success in that sort of genre of writing. Sure. I, I'm not a very sort of... Um, I'm not massively into criticism uh, at, at a particularly abstract or competent level with the stuff that I enjoy. And when it comes to games, the, the thing that most people can agree on is it's about 
the creation of an emotion while you're playing games. And when I play games, it's still most often um, to to take up time in an enjoyable way. Mm. Uh, if I have an hour spare, and I, and I get very bored very easily, and I find it very unpleasant to be bored and not have anything to do. If I'm currently playing a game that can occupy me for an hour, like Rocket League or like Metal Gear Solid Five, that's really great. And for a game to take all of my attention for an hour, it also needs to be really good. So it's not that all of the artistic elements of Metal Gear Solid Five are not being used on me. Yeah, yeah. It's just that it's very hard for me to analyse within that framework uh, what about it is important and what isn't. I mean, the way that it's like a schlock action horror film uh, allows me to turn off a lot of my criticism in terms of what's bad about it because... Mm. Whenever it's bad, <laughs> it's quite a lot like those films, which are bad in very similar ways. So I'm able to just say, well, even though it's being bad here right now, it's not being bad outside of this genre. So that's 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 good. Um, but you know, reading your article on on games criticism uh, just made me further increasingly aware that the kind of language you have to use when you want to try and get any kind of objectivity is so far beyond what I do when I'm casually discussing games with friends that I'm really not very advanced in that area at all. This is one of the things that I've been interested in and talking about and that I'm continuing to look into is what is the point of criticism of games when games do that function very well. So for you, because you're a designer and a developer and you don't have an art background, you will take the most information about the nature of games and making games from games themselves. You'll play a bunch of games and think about them, think about what you like, what you don't like, what you might want to borrow or modify. And to me, that seems very, very effective because it's so, anyone can play a game and have opinions about it. But with a lot of criticism, just from a vocabulary standpoint, it can be difficult. I mean, I was reading an interesting article by Lana Polanski today, and in it she linked to Wikipedia on every single term that might be a bit difficult for someone to understand. And that's that's a really interesting approach to that problem. I'm not saying it's a perfect approach, but it's really interesting. She had this awareness that a lot of people from games reading that wouldn't know what formalism was, or they wouldn't know what uh, a rubric was, and so on. So I think one interesting area for criticism, both of the sort of written and game variety, is how it contributes to the experience of people like you who aren't going to read an academic uh, dissertation. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just humans are such subjective beings that it's, in, in, it's crazy that you have to go so unbelievably basic and you have to build up this logical language before you can have any attempt at objectivism. Hmm. And, and that's, I guess, what formalism is about. And it's just kind of boggling because we can do kind of 85% of it just by having a conversation yeah. using normal language, normal words that generally two people talking at the pub will understand. But to cross that final 10-15% you have to completely change the language you're using <laughs> that's absolutely and, right um, and you know I, I'm not sure I can be bothered but I, I'm glad that you can <laughs> yeah it's difficult it's really really difficult I mean the, all of those critical terms are basically there to make life easier they're supposed to be a shorthand but if you come into something I mean I'm reading Ian Bogost's uh, um, what's it called what is the name of that book? Unit Operations. Um, and I have to read it in very small sections because the vocabulary is intensely academic. Um, there's a loads of stuff I, I have never heard of in there. There's loads of words I don't know. Um, and I mean, I studied English at university. I, my vocabulary is reasonable, but there's a lot of words that I don't know. So I have to go through and look everything up. And that's very fascinating, but it takes a huge amount of time and energy. And a lot of people who are involved with this stuff involved with game development don't want to put the time and energy into that i mean i can't imagine you ever doing that and that's not a bad comment on you it's just um the nature of it so i do think there are conversations to be had around sort of utility and accessibility of criticism but also i think that writing like this to return to the topic is a good way of dealing with that absolutely Friends of Mode 7 Spilt Milk Software have released a free RPG in order to promote their newly graduated from early access title Tango Fiesta. Um, so this is very interesting. I had a look at this game. I want to read you a couple of the Steam reviews. Uh, was really bad. Fed all game and did nothing. He tried to use his sword, but it turned out he was useless at even doing that. Minus 2.5 out of 10. Would never play again. 
Uh, no wonder this came out on 9-11. It's like reliving the single worst experience of my life all over again. Plus he fed all game. 1.5 out of 11. Now, I barely understand those two things. And I think that's indicative of what happens when you release one of these free games. So I'm going to ask you, do you think devs should be releasing free adver games in this context? Uh, do you know what fed all game means? So I think that this is from the MOBA thing of feeding. So if you feed in a MOBA, it's when you die repeatedly to a member, the same member of the opposite team, and you give them gold. Oh, I see. I think fed all game is a reference to that, but I could be wrong about that. I've never actually seen it used exactly like this out of that context. Right, so in general, the, the topic of um, of whether, you, whether releasing a free game that has nothing to do with the game you're trying to promote to promote that game is a good idea or not. Now, obviously, people have been releasing free demos and free shareware bits, etc., etc., free parts of games for Time Eternal. I was I was kind of split on this. I thought that the game itself, uh, the free game, looked pretty pretty fun. It was a bit of a, a bit of a Zelda, a bit of a JRPG kind of take, and I I kind of imagine it's probably a little bit <laughs> a little bit too self-referential for a lot of the people who are going to play free games on Steam. And I'm not... I don't know if it did anything specifically interesting enough to get a load of news around it. Mm. Um, And it got some really, really terrible reviews. I mean, frankly, maybe that's what uh, Andrew from Spilt Milk needs to just be talking about all of the time. He got some... uh, Yes, it did get some good good reviews as well. Um, I think uh, this is weird. Uh, I... (laughs) The problem is that I know how much hard work it is, especially like these guys have been working on Tango Fiesta for a long time and they they released it today and I, I saw a picture on Twitter of Andrew Roper like at 7am working on the build still today to get it out. So yes, they, that's a no-no by the way, people. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that problem. Um, and then you have that little time and then you're going to make this free game. I just think it's innately going to be bad because you don't have time to do it well. I haven't played this, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm honestly trying to... I don't want to be too negative about this um, because I am honestly trying to work out if I can think of a scenario where I, where this would be a cool thing. But if you're making a game that's got nothing to do with the game you're promoting, mm. it, you know, so you're not, you're not promoting the game by giving people a taste of what they're going to be playing. Um, I, I'm really glad they tried it. I would love to hear all of the data on it from them. Um, I could imagine there there being some pos- possible upside about this. I, I, I want to hear the data. I'm not seeing that this is going to be the thing that everyone's going to do. And as you implied there, we probably would rather the devs were spending more time <laughs> polishing the game well, they're actually trying to sell to you rather than doing this. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I kind of just want to see if it works. You know what would be good for this? Um, something like the Serious Sam spin-off games, which were just awesome right. in their own right, which were done by a bunch of other devs. And when you have a well-known IP, I think bringing out something like that, like a month before launch, would be an absolutely brilliant PR move. And you could get in this whole range of devs, you know, um, to do it, many of whom wouldn't need a big budget. So I really think that would be a cool a cool thing to well, do. Well, no, I mean, I absolutely loved that move. Yeah, that was yeah. one of the coolest things that a, that a games company has done. It reminded me of, I think, for the release of The Matrix Reloaded, the Wachowskis got six really high-profile manga people to do a manga short in The Matrix yep. universe. Yep. And they were pretty good, actually. And obviously, you have to have an absolutely massive IP. I'm actually slightly surprised that Sirius Sam was big enough to make this work. Yeah. Um, but that was really cool. I'm just wondering whether maybe I would want to do, like, a mod, like a Half-Life 1 mod to... Uh, to <laughs> to promote our next game you should definitely do that i'd be up for that you could do it in one day it would be terrible yeah. we get awful steam reviews i mean i think the point of this is to get attention right and they've achieved that because we're talking about it other people talking about it it's been noticed it gets the game you know the name tango fiesta on a load of stuff again anything you do to do that is good i mean i dressed up as a robot and walked around the park to get our game back in the press before launch so i, I don't have anything else to say about that really <laughs> good are there too many long games coming out these days? In a piece for Kotaku, uh, Keza McDonald wrote about how stressful it can be to have a large backlog of huge games uh, and to be expected to have played them all. Do you think this is just an artifact of the current fad for open world games? I think that open world games are the biggest problem here. And I think it's because uh, a lot of the stuff they are doing isn't working. Uh, what 
what Kez McDonald talks about in this piece is finishing the tutorial for a game, such as the new Batman game or the new GTA game, and then opening the map and suddenly seeing a billion little notifications of things that you can go and do. Like, you can go and get your hair cut here. You can go yeah. and do some vigilante justice there. And that's not working. That's not good design. That's really bad. That's always been my problem with the GTA 3 and onwards design of these games. It's what Far Cry 4 and Far Cry 3 does, and it bothers me there as well. Um, it's just it's terrible experience to suddenly be given a million meaningless choices. Yeah. I, I'm not suggesting that we go back to the time beforehand when there were only ever three different things you could do at once, uh, and that was how you progressed. I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, but there is a better way. I believe there's a better way, and it's not about having a bunch of every single mini game you can think of be represented at some place on a map. I really disagree with that. And actually, uh, I can't go beyond talking about this in really silly terms, but that's what I am trying to do with our next game, is trying to solve that problem. Basically, with a game like this, you want your games, your big budget AAA games, to have a huge amount of content. That's absolutely what you want. But you, they also need to be amazing experiences if someone only has half an hour to play them. That's how you're going to win at everything, and mm. that's what games need to do better. I think a couple of things about this. One is that I don't know that all these games need to be this big and long. I know that people tend to complain if they're short, and that really annoys me because it's very it, that puts commercial pressure to make things more homogenous whenever people do that. I fine. I understand if it's overpriced. You know, it's a different a different question. But I think it would be interesting to see some smaller size open world games where the content is handled differently so that's one thing the other thing is just to follow on from a point you made seeing this map with all these notifications on it it's like a boring menu of a lot of as you say meaningless choices a lot of things that you know are going to be kind of trivial in their own right and in many ways it's kind of the opposite of what i call the oblivion moment where you come out of the dungeon and you see the world for the first time and the feeling you get from that that has now almost gone from all of these games yeah absolutely right uh, on both counts now uh, I happen to be massively in favour of smaller open worlds, but I want to be clear that doesn't necessarily I mean there should be less content or that the games should be shorter, although I think that I have some time for that opinion as well. I would much rather have a city that was a fifth of the size of GTA V City, but that was much more detailed yeah. in an interesting way. This is something that the ga that the Dark Souls, Demon Souls games do pretty well. They have like pretty small but extremely detailed open worlds. Um, just having a massive, massive map on its own, like we're past that. That was really exciting in the late 90s and early noughties, but we don't necessarily need that from open world game anymore. Open world doesn't have to be massive. You know, in terms of do they need to be that long, I, I'm a... I personally like the feeling that there's so much game I'll never actually get very far with it. Yeah, now, yeah. that's not to say that I want a walking simulator that I have to walk for 100 hours. That's a game I want to be short because I don't have that much time. But there's something so exciting about just immersing myself in Metal Gear Solid Five and knowing that it's just absolutely huge and I'll never reach the edges of it. Yeah, that's definitely a cool feeling that, that needs to be there. I mean, I just think you're you're so right about detail. Um, it is something that's got lost. And the problem is now that you can't impress with size anymore because Elite Dangerous exists. I mean, and games like that exist where there's a billion solar systems that you can go to. So the, the like, oh, my map is bigger than yours problem. I just, you, you're not going to win that now because procedural generation makes it possible to be infinitely large. So you've got to focus on how interesting it is, not how big it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I've always thought that the idea of a of sort of a, you know, the kind of size I'm, I would love to play a game in would be something like uh, Hogwarts School from Harry mm, Potter. Yeah, it's big enough to have really interesting areas that you, you're not always in the same place, but it's totally small enough to be completely detailedly modeled and for you to feel like you're in you're in one place. One of the reasons why I love Half-Life 1 much more than I love Half-Life 2 is because it's set in the same place and there's real coherence to it. So that's definitely a thing that I want. I want it to be big enough to have freedom but small enough to really feel the coherence around it. Awesome. 
Reports indicate that Konami have stopped production on all AAA games uh, except for Pro Evo and a few bits and pieces for Metal Gear Solid 5. It is expected that the games company will only produce mobile and licensed stuff from now on. Uh, what do you make of this? I actually have a feeling that Konami is a bit of a troubled company. Um, I They were, you know, a, a really big sort of in inverted commas, proper publisher during the SNES and Mega Drive days and and after that. And it seems like they've just been slowly getting more and more on the fringes uh, in the last decade. I think it's, it's really troubling when a company basically goes on a gold rush after things like F2P, F2P and says, this is where we want to be. I'm, I'm a bit concerned that there's no real love for, for gaming at the top of the company anymore. And it's, and it's more about finding whatever the most profitable thing is mm. uh, to an extent that is, that is damaging. Um, so that that's kind of all the insight that I have on it. It's interesting to see, uh, yeah, as you say, a long-term AAA publisher kind of really run into problems. And it's not really been talked about that much. I think a lot of people have kind of missed this, to be honest. Um, yeah, it, it's weird. And the stuff with Kojima and kind of falling out with him, him being the sort of major asset for like the enthusiast slash inverted commas core gamers um, that they've kind of lost. Uh, it's very, very troubling. And, and yeah, I also don't think the right way to rehabilitate a company is to focus down on these very specific areas. I mean, I say that maybe their, you know, licensed gambling stuff and mobile stuff is going to be profitable enough for them to build back up. But it does look like a worrying sign. Yeah, apparently Metal Gear Solid Five cost $80 million to make. Crazy. And uh, I think they'll they'll make that money back off this game in particular, but I can understand them not wanting to be in the business of making games that big anymore. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't want to be in the business of being a AAA publisher right now. I think it's really hard to succeed, but but that's what they have been, and making this kind of pivot uh, just seems unwise to me. But, you know, I'm, I have no idea what's going on internally. We did a tiny bit of work with Konami a long time ago, yep. uh, looking at a, working on some, some quiz machine thing, and it was very nice working with them. But, but even then, I got the sense that... Um, that they were looking for various different directions to pursue rather than having a strong uh, individual uh, core idea of where to go. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think they people know sort of what Konami's de- defining thing is. Um, and hopefully, like I said, this will give them a chance to rebuild because they have done some some great stuff. And also, yeah, as you say, the UK Konami team are absolutely excellent to work with, very, very good people. So uh, we do wish people at Konami well. <laughs> Antivirus firm ESET have published an analysis of what they believe to be a new type of malware. It targets users of online poker websites and reports their hand and the room they are playing in to a central server in order to give some unknown party or parties an unfair advantage. What makes this different to other malware is that it doesn't try to directly hijack a user's account, instead going for a much more subtle approach. What do you think about poker malware? I think this is pretty cool. Yep. Um, it just seems like malware is is never gonna stop like this is the part like a really fundamental part of the new age we're in and uh you know i i love the idea you could have a virus that is telling everyone else what your poker hand is that sounds really horrible i know it's it's yeah it's so weird it's this is definitely the the new intersection of kind of the amount of human stuff that happens online with the way that you can exploit it technologically you're peeking at someone's cards yeah, I, I don't know when we're going to get to a really stable place with antivirus. The, the problem is that antivirus software is usually so annoying mm. uh, and often quite expensive. Uh, but we've got this real problem that our computers aren't secure enough and, and they're obviously powerful enough to run uh, some pretty dangerous code. And it's just a question of whether you, you, of keeping up with the ways in which you can be infected. I mean, I tend to think that just not downloading dodgy files is enough and it and it, it generally is but i'm placing a lot of trust in microsoft and firefox etc etc to make that true i don't want to go in the direction of apple and have a closed down system at all mm. but it's definitely something that requires really active uh white hat stuff to yeah. just just try and combat the the 
the massive escalation from the bad guys. Right, and there's so many incentives to do stuff like this. Like, this is really obscure. I could imagine this has not been detected for a really, really long time um, because it's such a weird sort of attack vector. Um, I think you're right. It just has to be an ongoing battle. I mean, this is why a lot of people are saying that InfoSec is like the hot future thing to go into if you're in technology. You don't go into games, go into InfoSec because as you, you, like the battle kind of never ends. I do wonder, I, I think a lot of antivirus stuff still seems to be very kind of post hoc. It's about like someone knows the composition of the malware and then that gets out to the antivirus thing and then it search, searches for it. I believe that's an extremely simplistic idea of how it works. Um, I don't know if there's a more sort of adaptive thing that people could do that, that breaks that paradigm in future to make more secure antivirus. Yeah, I don't know. That sounds basically like the only, like the combination of that and just trying to not let anything come on your computer. Those two things seem like the most intelligent and plausible approach to me because you're just not going to be able to have an intelligent enough system that can see this stuff developing on your own machine, I don't think. Yeah. I think that's sort of almost specifically impossible because people are always going to be able to get ahead of it um until we have like full level artificial intelligence patrolling our computers which is probably got enough other things wrong with it yeah there we go and that's the quote of the week uh don't let anything come on your computer Former hedge fund manager turned mid-pharma CEO Martin Shkreli was in the news this week thanks to his somewhat dubious practice of jacking up the prices on old but still essential medicines. There is a lot of controversy around this, which we probably won't get into in that much detail. Um, they've now said they'll drop the price of this drug again, but let's talk about video games. Shkreli's ethical flexibility in this and a number of other areas could have dire consequences for the esports team he owns. According to Riot's League Championship rules, any team with a member, manager, or owner who is found to be engaging in, quote, immoral or disgraceful behavior may be prevented from competing. Do you think esports should be taking moral stance like this? Well, this specifically is a problem that happens in traditional sports all of the time. Right. Because traditional sports teams are owned by very rich people and very rich people are often into dodgy business practices. And it happens in the NFL all of the time, happens in British soccer all of the time. So there is a precedent for this. And the answer is basically that it doesn't really end up affecting the leagues that much. Yeah. The owner of a sports team is is just really another character in the soap opera that is that sport. And he's and it doesn't tend to be particularly related to anything that happens in inverted commas on the field. So it's important that leagues have incredibly vague language like this so that they can mm. if they really need to chuck people out if they're if they're Donald Sterling or something do something on that level but in general it doesn't tend to cause that much of an issue i think where it does start to and it's a story that we that we considered for this week that we don't actually look we're not looking at specifically uh is a gambling company creating uh a pro sports team yeah. a, a company that does pro sports gambling in fact skin gambling as we talked about earlier and whether that causes a problem and that, and that i think that's a bit more of a of a sticky issue Right, yeah, especially in some of those situations, there were actual allegations of match fixing, not just the potential for match fixing, but actual allegations. That kind of becomes quite complicated, especially when they're involved in gambling uh, on the the sport itself. Um, and yeah, I think the thing with this for me is making rules about what people can and can't do that isn't illegal, that affects your status as an owner, I think is you start to get into very difficult territory here. I feel like there's a kind of correct balance which comes from public pressure. So if the public decide that they don't want this person associated with esports, then that's going to be effective. You know, they're going to, it's going to cause a huge problem for that team and the owner will either have to distance themselves or sell the team. I don't know if I think that it's right for the league itself to be legislating. Yeah, you've got to have villains as well. Right. Like right. that just makes all of this stuff a lot more exciting. <laughs> I mean, I, I when I first heard about the story to do with this uh, this crucial medicine that he that he jacked up by fifty times the price, I really wasn't expecting to talk about this on the podcast. No, um, but yeah, he's a villain. I, I have to say, I was made pretty angry by that. I mean, th th nowadays most 
stories that you read online have two sides and, and you get very upset about reading the sort of the really one-sided approach and then you you find out that actually all the details weren't given and it's something else but both this and the Volkswagen uh, emissions scandal uh, in the last couple of weeks have made me more angry than <laughs> I'm used to being at this advanced age so yeah I mean I want him to be in this league and I want to root against his right, team yeah that's a that's a very good response to it yeah I think with this specifically it was one of those things where I felt initially like I didn't really know the detail and I didn't want to get into it. But then I saw this quote from him and he was like, well, if we put the price back down, we'll have to run at a small profit. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> you know, OK, well, if you if you misjudge what people have said to you that much, then it's very clear to me that you could easily do something really terrible. <laughs> like if you think that's what people care about, then then you know there's going to be problems elsewhere and you're right like if this guy's an esports figure then uh, people start booing his team and stuff then i think that's fine i think that's probably better than saying if we don't like you very much we can ban your team yeah definitely the PS4 will soon be joining the Xbox One in offering early access games. From next week, users will be able to pre-purchase in-game currency for F2P title Dungeon Defenders 2 and play a pre-alpha build of the game. Is this a big deal? I'm not particularly convinced this is a big deal. I'm not sure. You know, maybe this is Sony kind of testing the waters, but this isn't really the first time this has happened in a lot of ways because quite a lot of bigger games have a pre-order and get beta access thing it's generally like um like a short beta time period so i think there was something like a halo and a destiny thing where a few months before release if you pre-ordered it you were you were allowed access for a couple of weeks or something which is definitely fundamentally different to early access on 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 steam but i'd need to see a lot more of it going on i'm not necessarily in favor of early access on the playstation 4 i haven't quite worked out what i think about that but i'm not sure this is like the beginning of the landslide i think it's nice to have a platform like ps4 which is curated but quite open um and i think that that's good because it really encourages the ps4 is where i go to for the sort of high quality stuff that i can use you know like you were talking about earlier as a distraction it's not where i kind of want to explore like super innovative stuff i mean i guess there's things like everybody's gone to the rapture and so on but but sort of really sketchy like really lo-fi weird stuff it's not the platform for me so i don't know if i would want a full early access on there if that happened i don't know if it would massively change everything I mean, I think if you had full early access Steam style on consoles, it would just make a lot of money. Um, so I do wonder if we're headed that way inevitably. Yeah, I, well, there are a lot of issues here. I mean, I think that it's it's always a dodgy proposition for, for me or anyone else to sort of say, oh, it, you know, early access is fine on the PC, um, but there are X, Y, and Z reasons why I wouldn't want it on another platform. I mean, but... I still think that the platform holders believe very strongly that one of the important parts of a console's brand is its ease of use. Um, so I think that in general they want you to be able to boot up a game and have an expectation mm. that it's going to work well. And I think they're often thinking about the parents of little eight-year-old Jimmy <laughs> and they need to have the the... The, the guarantee that when they buy Jimmy a game, it's going to start up properly and it's going to play properly. So I would be surprised if they ever ever did that. In terms of whether it would make a lot of money or not, I mean, I, I guess it must do. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, there's definitely that quality control aspect that I do feel differentiates consoles and there is an argument for keeping that in place i think brand values and all that stuff but i do wonder if this is going to be the gateway to more weird early stage stuff happening on console i i feel like that's kind of inevitable just because as i said the the financial element of that um but we'll see maybe there's a new ish way that they can do that like more of these kind of beta things where the game is is at a certain state um, and it can be released on console and maybe it's like allowed to crash one in every 10 times. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it, it's going to require them, if they do do it, it's going to require such a big change in their pipeline yeah. 
you know, we've worked with Sony fairly closely, and I know a lot of people who've worked with them very closely, and I understand how their process works now, and in terms of marketing games at release and trying to work out what slots they want to put things in, etc., uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there um, that would require a, a huge rethink under early access. I think it's important to remember as well, the PC platform, and Steam especially, one of the reasons that we love it is that it's like the most Wild West open platform, and it kind of makes sense that early access would think would be a thing on the PC and I think that it's in some ways I'd like to view it as less of a of an economic certainty that it's just going to be something that makes money so it's going to make its way onto all the platforms and more think of it as one of the really nice side effects of the PC platform that that really still might not be sort of particularly workable on the consoles. That's the end of that, and now it's time for regular feature Ian's Magic Corner, where Ian talks about Magic the Gathering. Hello, welcome to Ian's Magic Corner. Uh, as usual, I've talked to Visiting the Village Magic the Gathering correspondent Tom Richards, and I've come up with something to talk about this week. So this week sees the release of Battle for Zendikar, which is the new set, um, and a couple of interesting storylines about it. And We're going to talk about something called the Fat Pack in general. Okay. So... Uh, as most people listening to this podcast probably know, you need to have land uh, to play Magic. Uh, approximately a third of the cards in your deck need to be land. Um, there are five different colours of land, and there are lots of advanced lands. Um, but any any deck needs uh, a quite a large amount of basic land. Possibly because Magic are worried about Battle of Zendikar being a slightly boring set. They have released it with what's called full art land, where the entirety of the card uh, is made up of a really pretty picture, and and it doesn't it doesn't have the traditional white third at the bottom talking about what the card does. So, this has happened once before, five years ago, and uh, it's always been very popular. People people love to have this land, and five years later. Um, a full art land from five years ago costs about a pound, which is about five times as much as a basic land costs on the singles market. Anyway, so you one of the products that Magic, that Wizards create, is called the Fat Pack, which is, I think, nine standard boosters and a pack of 80 basic lands uh, for £30. Pounds. Wow. And this is... I don't think it's a particularly popular box set in general, but... Something's been going on with Battle for Zendikar, and it's completely sold out from pre-orders. And there's a suggestion that there might have been some screw-up with production in China. There's been a suggestion that Wizards have decided to set the price, uh, set, set the production to be much lower. And there's also just a suggestion that it's so popular that it's sold out. But basically, the thing that I kind of want to just talk about is... This, this thing comes with 80 basic lands, which is generally not very uh, not very sort of valuable in itself, but with this full art land, it'll probably end up being very valuable. So the idea of buying land in this particular set is, is a much bigger deal. But obviously they've always sold fat packs. Is it a significantly different product hmm. just because this set specifically has much more valuable lands? Right, so this is pretty interesting. I, the first thing that kind of jumps out to me of this is that you always get this thing when something sells out, you always get this conspiracy thing about like, did they make it low so that it would be more popular and they could say it was sold out? And does that mean they hate their fans? And knowing how just random distribution of stuff is and how difficult it can be to get these supply chains working, that always seems to me to be like the least likely explanation. And there's something really human about assuming that a process like that is very very strongly designed to have an effect on, on kind of deep parts of the community. Um, so that's interesting. The second thing that you, you mentioned is that this this kind of fat pack idea where you're putting all this land in, I guess that to me, no, not knowing anything about this at all, that sounds pretty interesting, especially if they've done it before. I think as a non-magic player, the idea of these very lavish art land things, that sounds really nice to me. So I was thinking, I was thinking that sounds like quite a good deal for £30. That might be attractive. Maybe that's attractive to new people. Yeah, you're, you're going to buy that now. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I and I think that the idea that they would use that every so often when they have a really kind of a, a set they're not too sure about, and it and that makes some sense because 
Uh, I've just read uh, an, an article by someone who really is not into this set, and he talks about the the fact that for every set, people want more and more powerful cards. So if you just let things go like that for forever, then there'll be this ridiculous inflation of power. And every so often, you kind of need a set or two that reduces the power. And they think that this is one of those sets. So it's kind okay. of, there are some nice cards and everything, but it's sort of maybe it's a bit of a fundamental resetting of what the landscape is like that. And they're using full art lands as a way of kind <laughs> of flavoring that, just making that okay. Which just, you know, again, every time I hear more about what goes on with wizards and how sort of savvy they are yeah um in in terms of the market i'm just really impressed right i mean just from the amount that uh visiting the village magic the gathering correspondent tom has talked about battle for zendikar i have a feeling that battle for zendikar is going to be a big deal <laughs> just you can detect uh, every facebook post that he makes or anything magic related that he links to is talking about some minor aspect of how battle for zendikar is going to be this enormous thing so I, I i think it's probably sold out because it's quite popular yeah or well, i mean i i kind of agree with that i i, I do wonder i i think it's definitely possible that it has had a the, the whole thing is sold out because of this land thing though because mm. i don't know if there's much different you know they have such a well-designed pipeline they release a set every four months and they know exactly how to ramp up everyone's interest they they sort of spoil a new card every three days in the months leading up to it and everything like that um well all right well i've, I've heard your your call on this <laughs> and maybe we'll find out in a couple of months whether it was flooding in china or it was a conspiracy or if it was just popular that's the most uninformed pure intuition call about almost anything i've made on this podcast so we'll see how that works right uh that's enough of that and now it's time for the games that were released this week in 2005 thanks to Eurogamer. so on the 23rd of uh september 2005 we have battle of britain 2 wings of victory on the pc uh, I don't know much about that. I assume it's a flight sim. It's got Battle of Britain and Wings in the title. Do you know anything about Battle of Britain 2 Wings no, of Victory? No, I, uh, I haven't researched for this section, and I Excellent. have not anything specific of this section. <laughs> okay, good. Well, well, in that spirit, we'll plough on. Burnout Revenge, we've heard of that on Xbox, PS2. Dynasty Warriors 5 on Xbox. Have you ever played a Dynasty Warriors game? Yeah, I played one for a couple of minutes on the Vita, hmm. and I'm not into kind of third person combat so it passed me by i am very poor on the whole rpg type thing i've never as we've talked about before golden sun is literally the only one i've ever played i should give it more of a chance i think uh everybody's golf 4 on the ps2 everybody's golf is quite was quite the franchise back at that point uh, yeah, I played uh, Everybody's Golf on the Vita a lot, and I like it. I like random golf games. I like the the name Everybody's Golf because it makes golf seem like an adjective, uh, and that's, <laughs> that's just funny. Uh, I Toy Kinetic on the PS2, uh, Fable: The Lost Chapters on the PC, which was the PC re-release that had a bunch of extra stuff in it. Fable: Heroes of the Pacific on Xbox, PS2, and PC. This was a good week for kind of your your war gaming. Uh, Meteos on the DS. Yeah, let's stop there. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a game I bought on release. Oh, yes. Probably around the 23rd of September 2005. Mm. And, uh, and absolutely loved. Played a lot. And I remember there was this problem, uh, this exploit called scrubbing. Yes, scrubbing. Where if you just basically kind of like pretended you were a toddler with a crayon <laughs> on the bottom screen of the DS, you could like kind of get out of any trouble. But I am, but I'm a very ethical games player, so I stayed away from that kind of behaviour. <laughs> Ethics in stylus control. Um, yeah, Meteos was was one of the things I think that made you certainly get very excited about the DS. Uh, and a lot of people think, hey, the DS is is like a real platform for real stuff, not just endless kind of flicking rabbits and Animal Crossing. Um, so yeah, Mist Five: End of Ages. Now. Is this this was a new Mist game at this point? I the the, the subsequent history of Mist uh, after Mist One absolutely passed me by, but I guess it was. We, we're going to have to have some event where we just like get wasted and play a lot of old Mist games because you're right. <laughs> I didn't realise there was a fifth Mist. We should, the event would just be like what happens if Richard Cobbett went to hell. Uh, it would <laughs> exactly. Uh, NHL 2006 on the GameCube, Warhammer 40k Dawn of War Winter Assault on the pc wwe day of reckoning 2 on the gamecube so that's a kind of 
yeah, there's a lot of war games in there. I don't know how happy I would have been on that week in uh, in 2005. You would have just been playing Meteos. Uh, you playing Meteos, but you're right. The rest is a little uninspiring it's not, to it's me. It's not as exciting. There was that week where there were like five cyberpunk games. <laughs> <laughs> they really just something about that month was particularly dystopian uh and this stuff is just different right onwards to the present day and it's time for the top 10 uk steam games at number 10 it's arc survival evolved will it ever go away uh darwinian evolution says no grand ages medieval uh which is a game from calypso and it looks like a kind of paradox style strategy type medieval-y thing so interesting to see that come in at pre-order 15 percent off number eight is blood bowl 2 hooray uh very happy about the success of blood bowl 2 congratulations to focus and cyanide um of course making a somewhat similar game with our opus frozen cortex we're always happy to see this kind of thing do well um i haven't played blood bowl 2 yet it'll be interesting um to give it a go at some point i think yeah and frozen cortex got mentioned in the rps review of blood bowl 2 which i was very happy to see as well good that is actually almost all we ever hope for is occasionally being mentioned alongside stuff so thanks to rps metal gear solid 5 the phantom pain is at number seven soma from frictional is at number six that did well on pre-order last week and it's still in the top 10 now that must be a really big success for them they have a lot of success and money already so i guess they're now just buying the uh, mansion from amnesia the dark descent rendered entirely in solid gold so congratulations to them Number five is Grand Theft Auto V. Number four is Elite Dangerous, which got a shout Ooh. out earlier in the in the podcast. Uh, yeah, forty percent off on that. Forty percent off is a lot, uh, a lot off that. If you haven't got that, I I think you should get it. Uh, Counter Strike Global Offensive also had a shout out. Number three, number two is Dying Light Ultimate Edition at fifty percent off, and number one is Dying Light itself at fifty percent off. Um, I don't know that much about Dying Light. It's in a genre that largely passes me by, but people like that genre. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've heard a bit about it, more about it recently, but I still haven't really uh, played it. And I'm just annoyed right now because on the Steam page, there's just like 50 videos and no screenshots. But uh, uh, that's not important. No, maybe maybe I'll play this. Maybe. All right. And now it's time for your listener questions. Uh, Joe Clacy says that he feels he should say that he told us about people suing crowdfunded products, uh, suing crowdfunded products that didn't des- deliver. So he basically just wants more credit and attention. Um, That's exactly what he wants. Yeah, he called this early on in Kickstarter that this was going to happen, and he whined at me about it on my text messages so i decided to bring it up here that's excellent. well done clacy you should feel good about yourself well done uh kickstarter li- litigation correspondent joe clacy tiny angry crab which is one of my favorite twitter handles uh at the moment well done tiny angry crab says question one how do you bros feel about steve reich now if if ian hardingham has heard of steve reich i will eat 25 hats right now unfortunately your hats are safe <laughs> because <laughs> I have not heard of Steve Reich. <laughs> Steve Reich is a famous minimalist composer. I do like a bit of Steve Reich. It's I've not explored that work that much. I tend to find the stuff that uh, was kind of created through his influence on electronic music a lot more interesting. But if there's a Steve Reich soundtrack going onto something and there's strings going diddly, 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 then I'm going to be happy with that. That's how I feel about it. Uh, number two is the best dinosaur. And the answer to that is a Triceratops. Uh, I was trying to think of some very funny gag about just an old person, but I'm afraid I'm just going to have to go with the Velociraptor, even though it doesn't really exist, or whatever, because I'm hugely in the tank for Jurassic Park 1. Okay, so let's break this down. Not only did you not make a gag, you you, you <laughs> flagged the failed gag, and then you went for, like, the most vanilla standard dinosaur to like. That's that's Well, hold on. I'm... The most vanilla one would surely be the T-Rex. Even oh, now, oh, even post Jurassic Park one. I, okay, the 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 chocolate and vanilla one, the second most obvious. Uh, Philip Back says, if Jeremy Corbyn <laughs> was a game, which game would he be? And I think he would be that game where you log into that website and all the people play Pong at the same time. <laughs> Well, wow, that's uh, that's very inclusive. You know, he might even be happy with that. I know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I didn't prepare for this either. I was just trying to think if there was a game that had bikes in it. What's a game that you ride a bicycle? Oh, uh, Pumped BMX. <laughs> sure, he'd be like a weird mod of Pumped BMX. 
<laughs> Good. Sandra Van Dragd says, uh, Okay, so I read your tweets about talk. What do you think of the strengths and weaknesses of it for indie gaming development? Off you go. I guess I better handle this one. Um, well, I think the strengths are that it's a reasonably, it's a very mature and reasonably fully featured engine that you basically get for free now and you can kind of do whatever you want with. So while I think that it's probably true that Unity is better for uh, the majority of people who don't want to spend their entire lives programming, I think that there is certainly stuff that's useful about a thing that isn't constantly changing that you don't have to worry about paying extra to get full source access for. Um, but in all honesty, nowadays, uh, the reason that I still use Talk is because all of our games are already in Talk and I've got ten, well, 13 years experience in it and I'm pretty, pretty good at it. Um, and I'm not sure exactly who I would recommend it to. It, it has really good netcode if you're making uh, a game that, that needs to have exceptionally good network code. Um, then talk something that you might look at, I suppose. All right, uh, related question. Dan Cohen says, do you have any thoughts on homogeneity of game engines in the industry and any impact it has? Now, we've talked a lot about how Unity causes um, this kind of very samey uh, effect, particularly with things like additive glow and lighting and blur shaders and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of games that look like Unity games. We're starting to see people really manage to avoid that effect now um, as there are so many games coming out in Unity. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I still are very much a believer in the smell of an engine <laughs> and... It is possible with like an awful lot of work to get past all of the aspects that Engine has that will remind you about all the other games that use it. But I think it's actually surprisingly hard. I mean, you bring up, uh, you know, a, a very well specified issue with Unity specifically. Um, and, you know, there are lots of different kinds of UI toolkits and everything. So U Unity games tend to do quite a good job of differentiating themselves but i still think that that's actually an issue like like on a subconscious level um with people there's something really nice uh metal gear solid 5 uses its own engine and it's so nice that it's not the unreal engine mm. like mm. i can definitely tell yeah and there's something which makes it feel really exotic um so just on those terms um in a kind of sort of really kind of silly level uh i really like making games that, that, that don't use a homogenized engine and I like it when I play a game that feels really new because it's not uh, in a homogenized engine. Uh, I think that you know if you if you're not a massively 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 good programmer then all of the advantages you get from using a pre-existing engine one of the big ones especially unity are overwhelming but but of course just like anything else as soon as the majority of people are doing one thing it's much better to do something else um, because you get uh, a lot of differentiation for free especially in an arty landscape so um, it's pick your poison really yeah i think there's kind of a music analogy here which is that a lot the the tools you use definitely cause you to do things in a certain way but there's a point at which the the tools become so flexible that you can do any approach within them um, so, but there's still a really a couple of interesting examples. Like, there's a musician called Venetian Snares who I've talked about a lot recently, and his music is completely mad. And one of the reasons it's completely mad and brilliant is that he does it all in tracker programs, particularly a really old uh, PC tracker called Renoise. And all of his music sounds like this very rapid sequence of very tightly uh, quantized notes, which is exactly what a tracker is good at. It's not good at doing free flowing, expressive kind of you know rolling sort of style music. It's very good at like jerky, sudden transitions, um, and that perfectly suits him. So there is this point at which um, a tool can have a massive creative influence on you. Yeah, I'm generally in favour of embracing the technology you're using. Yeah, um, it's never a good situation if you have to fight something no. to get it to do something it's not designed to do. Um, so if you can find a way of just going over the top by using the actual existing features of something, then that's always good. Now, you have something that I think is perhaps the most serious and difficult topic we've ever discussed on the show. Now, 
I unfortunately read about this again today, so I'm slightly concerned that this is something that other people have heard about by now, or maybe there's like some kind of sexual connotation I'm unaware of. But apparently, a huge, uh, hugely popular thing now is is YouTube videos of people unwrapping Kinder eggs and exposing the the toy that comes inside them. So it's just like an unwrapping of a magic booster pack video or something like that. But it's it's getting the toys from Kinder eggs. And I've always been massively in the tank for Kinder eggs, so this just was the bo- the best thing I'd heard of for a very very long time in the tank for kinder eggs since 1878 um there's no cheshire this week i don't have anything to add by the way i'm moving on there's no cheshire this week um he said everything we said was perfect so that's good (laughs) i do have have a quick follow-up from last week we talked about xbox live indie games and there was an article in rps today about mommy's best games which is one of my favorite studio names incidentally releasing a bunch of their x big shooters on pc so as we said some of the the cool content from there is getting a new home and that's really great get all that stuff out of there and put it somewhere else that's the end of that. And now it's time briefly for the television and film lounge area, which I've somewhat sprung on Ian Hardingham today, so don't expect anything above his usual brilliant level of improvised cogency. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Narcos, but not too much. Everyone's talking about Narcos. I, have you seen Narcos yet? Uh, no, I, I read uh, Andy Greenwald's piece on it on Grantland, and it kind of, uh, to be honest, I'm really done with gritty violent stories about how crime organizations rose to power like Fair i'm enough. really completely out on that i think that you might want to give this a go because it's okay. quite an interesting format so it's done kind of it's based on a true story that doesn't really matter it's done kind of as this documentary that the, the the protagonist the sort of um dea drug official guy does the voiceover and it's like he's explaining to you kind of from their perspective what's going on all the time in voiceover and the main character the the drug baron is just absolutely amazing he's he's really good at the actor is really good at striking this perfect balance between the horror of what he does and the kind of slight weird comedy and odd entrepreneurial spirit of it so for example there's a scene in which he it's the first time he does anything really really shocking uh he murders a bunch of these people who have been troubling his organization and hangs them from a tree and it shows him and his friends like trying to stage the most effective photo of it that they can take for the press right. so he's doing that this horrible thing he's like say lift his head up lift his head up and they're trying to do this and then a woman walks up to them with a child in a in a, a push chair coming down the the road in this park where they are and he goes oh no they can't see this. and he runs after the, her and just like completely charms her and asks her about her kid and it's really nice to her and says I'm really sorry the park's closed today and just walks her out and this is absolutely brilliantly staged scene of this complete like dispassionate horror with this kind of like funny amiable like him being nice to this mother that that, that really sold the the show for me was was that scene um so it does have there's a lot of kind of very almost virtuosic like direction and little moments in it but i do understand your thing about being jaded about that right like there's so much stuff like that now and it's so sort of in vogue to have all these articles and so on about these drug uh cartels and stuff so i can understand being bored with the theme yeah i mean I, i'm sure that scene was well done i, I just um I, i'm just fed up of seeing horrible violent acts and but then kind of also seeing the other sides of of the people sure, involved sure, sure. and you know really it's the sopranos was was enough all on its own to be honest yeah i mean again i think it this does the, this in quite a new way in in some ways but then that's fine that's fine um so that's that i'd also like to talk a little bit about m night Shyamalan and uh his latest work the visit now i don't want to spoil this for you so i mean i can avoid even talking about like its genre generally if you want me to do that uh um it's up to you okay. um i you know I, I i don't really mind if you spoil it for me okay so i'll talk i'll talk generally about it but i won't i won't give away stuff so already there is stuff to give away uh it, it's it's traditional Shyamalan in that sense but as you picked up from the trailer it's his version of like the low budget found footage movie and it's much right. more overtly a horror movie than anything else he's done there are a lot of jump scares in it um, almost to a ridiculous level it gets to the point by about 
after the first third where every scene is either some like weird David Lynchian thing or it's just like a straight up very tense horror scene. Um, And it's interesting to see him do that. It's actually been received quite well in horror circles as a genre movie. Wider critics, because they hate everything he does, hated this. And there's a lot to hate about it. Um, It's a very weird movie. I actually found it very disturbing because it's kind of like a lot of his stuff. It has that like ironic, is he taking the piss about everything uh, quality to it the whole time. And for me, that made it scarier. Um, right. It's so weird. It. W- I went to see it with my wife, and we both came out of the cinema and just stared at each other in a like, did we actually just voluntarily watch that way? Um, it, it's it's amazing. He's still one of my favorite directors. I'm afraid. I've been persuading people to watch The Village if they've never watched one of his films before. I still think that's his best one. Yeah. Um, so The Visit actually did pretty well in its second week. Right. Um, it had a yep. had a less than expected drop off after the first week, which is generally uh, a really good indicator of how popular the film was. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it, it ha- happens when people tell their friends to go and see something. So obviously, it has been well received. I am also a huge non ironic Shyamalan <laughs> fan. I really like the first half of Lady in the Water, which people really hate. Yep. And when it comes to the happening, mm. I am so clear that it's a massive piss take because. Whenever you cut to a menacing shot of trees in the wind, and when you have a whole scene where the boom mic is visible, and when you do all those different things, I understand that there's ambiguity there, but for me there is none. This was a film that was meant to be much more ironic than people took it. It's still a terrible film, don't get me wrong, but I kind of respect it enough. And I really like The Village. Uh, I have to say, I really Unbreakable is definitely my favourite. Uh, and yeah. lots of people hate Unbreakable. I really, 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 really like it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, did, I didn't like Sixth Sense that much, and I thought Signs was pretty good. Um, so I just like his films. I Yeah, I don't like Unbreakable. It's too... I, I think it's the kind of comic aspect of it that I that I dislike it didn't have that weirdness that a lot of his other stuff has I mean I uh, I have to say that I do think a large amount of his output is absolute garbage I mean the lady in the water is a film that I feel is hugely misinterpreted but even if it's interpreted correctly it's still a very bad film um and I, I'm completely fine with that the happening I've forgotten about the boom mic that that, that is interesting because I when I saw the happening again I kind of thought, and my concern with him is that it's completely earnest and he's just kind of slightly unhinged. And I saw that happening again. I thought, actually, I think this is completely earnest. I'm just not sure if he's operating at that level of sophistication where there's irony and and humour happening. I don't quite know. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's like a a question I'd like to ask an artist more than like to find out where he was on the happening. Because... I just want to fantasise it about it being this incredibly effective piss take mm. of of zombie films and horror films because it's so stupid. Yes. Every time you're supposed to have like a like a scene which is meant to show something menacing, you just see trees in the wind and it's absolutely great. And Mark Wahlberg, who I'm not really a particularly big fan of, but he is that is the kind of film he's in mm. generally. Mm. Yeah, I, I I think my suspicion with him still is that this is a really interesting case of authorial intention because he's the phrase unintended parody is used as just a general sort of pejorative, but actually I think he might be the master of unintended, <laughs> the master of unintended, unintended parody. parody because I mean the village is 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 a straight up great movie in my opinion. Uh, it's not perfect, it's quite silly in places, but horror is a silly genre. Um, so you have to deal with that. I really think that's a good film. Everything else has big problems, but yeah, the latter stuff is is weird. I mean, the visit is the visit has a character. There are these two kids. One of them is the fifteen year old filmmaker, and the whole thing is framed as her documentary, and that's immediately ludicrous because of load of stuff they they do. They, they just play around with that constantly, and her character talks about stuff like visual tension and the focal length of the camera in before scenes where the focal length of the camera the focal length of the camera is then used for a jump scare like in a scene like right after that's pretty good so there's a lot of that stuff going on and that has to be conscious but i i suspect that he thinks that's really 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 clever when in fact it's just silly and it kind of undermines the whole experience um yeah i can't it's not a film that i recommend that you watch if it was anyone other than Shyamalan, i would say you will not enjoy this don't watch it but 
it, it will certainly add to your experience of him. Um, it's kind of a completely disgusting film in a lot of ways, which is interesting okay. as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that. Fair enough. Right, that's the end of the show for this week. Thank you very much for your questions. Again, if you have those, you can tweet them to us. I'm Mode7Games on Twitter, and he's Ian Hardingham, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening, and goodbye. That's it, children. Time for bed. Don't forget to pay us a visit at www.visitingthevillage.com.